Well, good morning. Um, thank you for all coming. Um, um, my apologies for our late start here. Um, my name's uh, Jamie Horwitz. I'm a member of the Newsmaker Committee of the National Press Club. And we're delighted to, on this 30th anniversary of the Nation at Risk Report, to be talking about a new direction for education reform. And um, our speakers today will be Congressman um, Michael Honda, Kevin Wellner, who's at the university, a professor at the University of Colorado and also the director of the National Education Policy Center, uh, Professor Linda Darling-Hammond of Stanford University, and um, Mr. John Jackson, who's president of the Schott Foundation. And each of our speakers will speak for about seven to 10 minutes. And then after that, we'll, we'll throw it open for questions for about 25 or 30 minutes. I, um, I, and, and if you don't mind holding the questions till the Q&A period. So with that, um, why don't we ask uh, Congressman um, Honda to start us off. Good morning, and um, I'm the reason we started late, so. <laughs> <laughs> My, my father always said, state the obvious. And so, <laughs> thank, thank you for waiting to be a patient. And also, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, being here and w with this panel also. The, uh, let me get right to it. Um, the, uh, the report uh, for each and every child is probably the very first report that was put together by educators. Uh, we had Nation at Risk before. Uh, which uh, one of the comments that came out of there was um, if a nation to ever tried to impose a mediocre um, educational system in our country, that would be tantamount to declaring war. And, um, but as we move through our public education experience, we seem to be going more and more towards that um, mediocrity. And um, I think that there's a lot of effort in this country to try to improve our system. But I, I think that uh, in its effort, we have not stepped outside of the box to see what it is that we really need to do. This report brings together quite a few things. And uh, when you have 27 um, folks who have been engaged in education for the number of years that they've been engaged in, and for them to speak to each other and try to arrive at a, a document uh, with some consensus, it's, um, it's a real task because they all are experts in their own specific areas and they're bringing them together has been a, a wonderful experience. Uh, it took 22 months uh, to do this under the leadership of um, um, Chris uh, Edley, uh, who is the um, the Dean of Law over at UC Berkeley and um, Tino Cuellar, who uh, teaches uh, constitutional law at Stanford. And prior to that, we had um, a Reed uh, Hastings as one of the co-chairs. Uh, Linda Darling-Hammond was uh, uh, one of our major uh, contributors, uh, but they all participated in working towards this uh, report. And at times, uh, it was uh, push and pull but it was all with this one thing in mind, in, in understanding and trying to figure out how we provide equity in education and excellence in education for each and every child. One of the things that I was looking at when we tried to put together a, a bill, then it went through the appropriations process and um, Secretary of Education, uh, um, Arnie Duncan had moved it into a uh, commission I wanted to find out whether what we're doing could be done a little bit better. We know that public education has no common roots in this country. At least if you think about it, we don't. It was not mentioned in the Constitution, so therefore it was set aside to be the purview of the states. And so uh, up to now we have 50 states struggling every year to um, provide an equitable education to everyone uh, of their students. But when you look at the history of this country, since there was no educational system um, existing back in 1789, um, states were left to their own devices. And when you think about the, the um, genesis of uh, this country and the 
origin of a lot of the different kinds of efforts in education. It's all different. And it wasn't until 1950s that we started to realize that some of the principles of some states were not in conformance with the rest of this country. And I'm saying that some states had developed a concept and a principle of separate but equal. And these were brought together by the different states, reflecting their history and reflecting their background, and reflecting also the principle state by state. When TV came along, it brought those kinds of issues to our living room, and the civil rights movement started. And when we started to realize that separate but equal is existing in other states, it just didn't seem right. And then the civil rights movement really started getting going, and the rest of the country started to join into that. So we went from the civil rights movement, and from that, I think the phrase, um, all children have a right to an equal opportunity in education came about. And a lot of movements started uh, since then to make sure that we achieve uh, equal um, rights and e equality for all the children. Since then, we've tried desegregation. It hasn't worked. We've been looking at how neighborhoods are formed because we see that poor performing children come from poor schools that are found in poor neighborhoods. So the question's got to be raised, you know, how do poor neighborhoods come about? I mean, planners do not, you know, consciously develop poor neighborhoods. The, um, this great book, Closing the Opportunity Gap, it talks about a lot of different issues very, very candidly. And <laughs> I read some of it last night. The terminology for me is, you know, way up here. And the way I speak English is way down here, so it's more um, understandable. But what I had to do is translate a lot of the concepts that they were talking about. It dovetails with the kinds of things that the um, commission had put together. So one of the things that we're looking at is um, the, um, the report when we talk about each and every child, the binding principle for everything that I'm looking at f from here on out as a 30-year um, teacher is that looking at the, listening to the expression, instead of saying all children deserve an equal opportunity to education, to rephrase that, to have a better solution set and saying um, the achievement equity for each and every child becomes a binding uh, principle. How do we achieve equity for each and every child? And the, and the movement for resources in, in this country, we start looking at raising the average daily attendance. And there's a, there's a race in trying to see uh, how much money we need to have behind each and every child. Every state has a different level. But let's say in California, we achieved um, a ADA of $10,000 behind each and every child. Um, if we say that each child is different, then the effort and the resources behind the, each child would be different. But the way we set up our, our finance system is ADA, same amount of money behind each child. So that means that you know, every child has the same issues and will be um, taken care of by the same amount of money. That's the equal, but it's not equity. So if we look at each and every child, each child has different needs, then the cost of every child is gonna be different, and the resources to be applied to each child is gonna be different. And so we'll see different amounts of resources needed to bear upon each child in order for that child to be able to achieve the equity that we're looking for. So ADA is equal amounts or parity. Equity is that each and every child is afforded that which that child needs based upon assessments. When, when you go off on that tangent or that direction, the cost of education is gonna be very expensive. But what is the uh, cost right now that we're faced with as a nation in a, trying to find that silver lining for all our children? And I think that this path is gonna take us to the place where the each and every child will achieve that 
protection and that guarantee that our Constitution talks about, you know, guarantee happiness, be able to pursue uh, their own full potential. And so um, the areas that the, um, the report talks about is uh, focusing on each and every child and it talked about uh, teacher preparation retention in each and every child report, uh, focus on communities finding their own solutions in each and every uh, child's report. We're looking at school finance and that's gonna be really um, one of the nubs that I'll be looking at. And there's be arguments for ec excellence and uh, equity in the public schools. And the way things are moving, I think that our attention to resources and the term equity is gonna really move our country in the right direction. So I'm, I'm really grateful to all the uh, participants of the commission who had spent their, their own time and their own efforts to bring this report to fruition. And I think that this will be the, the basic compass that we can take use to move our country uh, towards that so that when we talk about education in this country, children in Appalachia will have the same efforts according to their needs as children in Westwood and Brentwood, East Palo Alto, as well as uh, uh, San Francisco. So I think that uh, the hope uh, that I have now is that this report will take uh, the, the dialogue and the debate to another level where each and every child will suddenly, you know, finally get the attention that they need, but also that parents will have and teachers will have and the public will have a dialogue that will drive us to start thinking differently about how to make public education better and also engaging the federal government at a greater level. Because I think that the federal government has been left out and we should be active partners in the fiduciary areas as well as the instructional areas. So I just appreciate uh, this opportunity to be able to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you. I think those last points uh, particularly are what I want to build on. The idea of uh, the, the nature of the conversation and the possible role uh, of the federal government I think are particularly important. And the, this, this nice um, consistency between uh, what, what we've done in this book, uh, what the Equity and Excellence Commission um, and the For Each and Every Child report have done. Uh, you'll hear what, what John Jackson's uh, group, the Schott Foundation, has been doing. There, there are a lot of people now who are entering this realm of, of thinking about um, not just the achievement gap, but the opportunity gap and, and how those two are related. Um, so my job this morning is to set the stage a bit and then to introduce you uh, to the new book and to the new campaign um, and the research and the possibilities for shifting gears um, and accelerating progress in our schools. Thirty years ago tomorrow, uh, the National Commission um, on Excellence in Education presented its report, A Nation at Risk, uh, to Education Secretary Terrell Bell. And the, the report's recommendations included adopting a more rigorous, or, excuse me, more rigorous and measurable standards systematically administering standardized achievement tests as, quote, part of a nationwide but not federal system of state and local standardized tests, unquote. Clearly that part of the report was acted on uh, with great gusto and um, much has happened uh, over the last 30 years. But let's, let's fast forward uh, past the 1989 uh, Charlottesville summit past President Clinton's Goals 2000 uh, legislation in 94. Let's jump right to the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001. And that law, along with the current administration's race to the top policies, have placed American school reform on a stark path best defined as test-based accountability reform, um, just as was called for 30 years ago in A Nation at Risk. But few policymakers or researchers would call these last 30 years a rousing success. Um, as one clear marker, I'm going to go out on a limb in this public forum and 
boldly predict that the nation uh, will not, in fact, have 100% proficiency by 2014. <laughs> um, and, but even by reasonable standards, the nation's uh, educational outcomes are not in better shape uh, than they were in 1983. Uh, certainly not in much better shape. And, and whether we're looking at overall scores or achievement gaps, the trend lines for NAEP, the so-called uh, nation's report cards, generally show a post-reform picture that looks very similar to the pre-reform picture, with positive trend lines, but uh, apparently slowing after 1990. There was, there was no way to, there really is no way to tease those data into showing that test-based accountability reform is accomplishing its key learning goals. We can debate whether the reform effort is a failure or simply a limited success, but what's clear to me and to the uh, expert authors in the, in the book that you have um, is that we've really squeezed all the benefits we're going to out of a laser-like reform, excuse me, a laser-like focus on, on measuring outcomes. In particular, we failed to build, to build capacity um, or increase opportunities to learn. Our intense focus on achievement gaps needs to be combined with an equally intense focus on opportunity gaps. The status quo of test-based accountability reform needs to give way to new evidence-based approaches dedicated to building, building the capacity to accomplish accountability goals. I refer to this as a movement from what I call gaps 1.0 to gaps 2.0. The old GAPS 1.0 conversation simply cannot get us to where we need to go. Children learn when they have opportunities to learn. When denied those opportunities, they fall behind and we get the devastating achievement gaps. But when they are provided with rich opportunities to learn, they thrive and the achievement gaps close. As our book explains, we as a nation have tons of good research evidence about what those opportunities are how they arise, and how to close them. We are ready to move to that new two GAPS 2.0 conversation and to recognize this truth, that we actually do know how and why students thrive and others falter. I applaud former President uh, George Bush for calling out the soft bigotry of low expectations, but a no excuses approach of increased expectations without increased supports is a recipe for continued disappointment and another generation of children who will never reach their full, their full potential. American society has the means to provide supports for communities, for families, for students, and for teachers to ensure that children are safe and healthy and ready to learn, that they have access to rich learning environments, in schools and also in their homes and in their communities and that they have qualified experienced teachers. We can build on children's strengths, supporting them and challenging them to excel. So the good news is that um, closing the achievement gap doesn't require magical quick fixes. The bad news is that to do it we need to stop grasping at those magical quick fixes. Indeed, we uh, must turn to evidence-based uh, best practices. Let me end by telling you about this new book. Uh, the idea was born in October of 2008 at a meeting at Stanford University uh, that was part of the 40th anniversary of the Kerner Commission Report. Uh, recall the, that the Kerner Commission Report included the warning that our nation is moving toward two societies, one black and one white, separate and unequal. It focused attention on our failing housing, education, employment, and social policies. At this 2008 meeting, uh, Linda, myself, Prudence Carter, and several other researchers who later wrote chapters in this book discussed our concerns that the nation's achievement gap focus had led policymakers to lose sight of the key opportunity to learn issues, certainly including those raised by the Kerner Commission. If we as a nation place obstacles in front of children relating to their housing, to their parents' employment, to social service policies, and to their formal education, then achievement gaps are inevitable. 
So after trying for a few years to find the time, uh, Stanford professors Prudence Carter and I, uh, with the support of the Ford Foundation, set out to bring together some of the top thinkers in the education community and to produce this Closing the Achievement Gap book. One thing the book makes clear is that our achievement gaps arise out of our opportunity gaps. And it also makes clear that the opportunity gaps are cumulative and involve much more than formal schooling. Last week, UNICEF re released a report on child poverty in 35 developing countries, or developed countries, excuse me. The U.S. came in 34th, second to last, between Bulgaria and Romania, two much poorer countries overall. 23% of children in the U.S. live in poverty. Finland, a country that uh, is at the top of the educational rankings, has less than 4% child poverty. It's not hard to see how poverty is related to education. A child without high-quality preschool, for example, faces even greater obstacles if she is also without good health care and good dental care, if her, if her parents have no stable employment, if their housing situation is unsure and transient, if her school has inexperienced and poorly trained teachers who themselves are unlikely to remain at that school for long, if the intervention required for low test scores at her school hinges on turnaround strategies that result in even more churn, if the school also faces overcrowding and has serious maintenance issues, if technology and learning materials are spotty and outdated, if she's shunted into dead-end, low-track classes that do, in fact, evidence a soft bigotry of low expectations, if educators and others do not understand her family's cultural and linguistic background and assume that these are deficits that cannot be built on, if her neighborhood is not safe and if it has it has few enrichment opportunities after school or over the summer, and on and on. How could responsible policymakers avoid the reality that closing achievement gaps means seriously addressing these multiple obstacles? Fortunately, the new book reminds us, policy solutions are within our reach. As our children do so readily, we now can seize an opportunity. We need to change the conversation and refocus the education debate on deeper, highly effective ways of doing education. The book authors explain how some schools and communities are currently addressing these inequities. And they also explain how those experiences can be the foundation for critically needed change in our education system. In addition, we have prepared a short description of some evidence-based policy recommendations available to you all here and also available on our website, um, which is nepc.colorado.edu. Importantly, our message here is not to ignore achievement gaps, quite the opposite. We are calling for an end, excuse me, we are, nor are we calling for an end to testing or other outcome measures. But those measures have taken on an unhealthy and outsized role. To state the obvious, tests don't teach, but they can be part of a careful evaluative, system, excuse me, evaluative feedback loop to help schools identify and address needs. In this way, GAPS 1.0 can bridge to GAPS 2.0. Outcome measures can be combined with smart, crucial inputs and capacity building. We're starting to see this uh, with the administration's attention to high quality early childhood education. We even noticed Secretary Duncan meet, uh, speaking about the importance of addressing what he also calls opportunity gaps. This is a small start, but it is indeed a step down a path that, if pursued with determination, will close our gaps, at opportunity gaps as well as achievement gaps. Thank you. Hi, I'm Linda Darling-Hammond. I'm a professor at Stanford. Kevin Wellner just referenced the meeting that we had there that uh, got some of this going. Um, and I want to just say a few words about the contents of the book, the statistics and analyses that are there, uh, and uh, how they may help us think about policy moving forward. 
Uh, as Kevin mentioned, for more than a decade, our focus has been ex almost exclusively on the achievement gap that's been productive in terms of calling attention to the disparate outcomes for different groups of children. Uh, but we've made relatively little progress um, in many states and certainly on the international stage uh, because we have not been addressing the opportunity gap. Uh, many of you know that there's also now uh, the achievement gap between the U.S. and other countries. Uh, and that uh, is partly a function of the fact that we have been pretty much uh, stable since about the 1970s in terms of dropout or graduation rates at 70, 75 percent. Other nations now uh, South Korea, Singapore, and others are graduating kids at more than 90 percent on the international rankings. We come in around 12th in reading, um, somewhere around 20th in science, somewhere around 25th in mathematics on the PISA assessments. That's been a surprise to people because we thought of ourselves as number one in the world. And in fact, uh, we were uh, back in the 1970s. Uh, and it's not that we've been falling backwards, but we have been experiencing growing inequality. Uh, in fact, uh, inequality is much greater now than it was at the end of the 1970s. There is more childhood poverty, about 60 percent more uh, young people living in poverty than was the case at the end of the 1970s. Uh, there are more discrepancies and gaps in the uh, funding that uh, states allocate to schools. Uh, there uh, is a, low, a smaller federal role. Uh, at the beginning of the 1980s, about 12 percent of education funding came from the federal government. That dropped to 6 percent in the 1980s. Almost all of that was pulled out from uh, equity-focused uh, policies to <clears throat> promote desegregation, to infuse uh, resources into cities, to support uh, teacher training for high need communities, uh, and so on. Something that's not often known <clears throat> is that, um, however, many of our schools are doing quite well. Uh, and if you look at the PISA results, uh, the Program in International Student Assessment, uh, we're actually number one in the world in reading achievement in schools that serve fewer than 10 percent of children in poverty. Among the high achieving countries, all of their schools have fewer than 10 percent of kids in poverty because they don't allow children to live in poverty. They have housing supports, they have health care supports, uh, and they have income supports for families and children that prevent concentrated poverty. Uh, we're actually uh, in schools that even have as many as 25 percent of kids in poverty, very high rate compared to other countries. We're third in the world in reading, uh, right be behind um, Korea and Finland, I believe. Uh, even for schools that have as many as 50 percent of kids in poverty, an extraordinary rate that you would not see in any of the high achieving countries in the world, we're above the average in reading. But our schools that have concentrated poverty, 75 or more percent of children living in poverty, typically these are also apartheid, segregated schools, African American and Latino, rank about 50th in the world uh, with developing countries with respect to reading. And it's those schools where we see this growing opportunity gap uh, most pronounced. Uh, and what we see also when we look at countries that have been moving rapidly forward, um, countries that 40 years ago were low achieving and inequitable, like Finland, like Singap Singapore, like uh, South Korea, uh, they have focused intensively on equity. They focused on creating a system uh, that expands the amount of educational opportunity available to those who were previous, previously excluded from educational opportunity. Uh, we were making progress in the 1970s in the Great Society and the War on Poverty. And in fact, there was a two-thirds drop in the uh, achievement gap in literacy um, uh, by the end of uh, the 1970s and into the 1980s. Had we stayed on course with those policies, we would have had no racial achievement gap by the year 2000. Uh, but almost all of the policies that contributed to the closing of the gap were eliminated in the 1980s and have not been reinstated since. In 1975, uh, for example, African American, Latino, and white students attended college at exactly the same rate. That had not been the case ever before. It has not ever been the case since then. Uh, so how does the opportunity gap get formed? Uh, first, as I've mentioned, there's a growing income gap. The you know this, the top 1 percent uh, of Americans used to control about 10 percent of the national income. It's now about 25 percent. Uh, in Manhattan, it's 48 percent. Uh, so we have a growing income gap. We have growing poverty. 
Uh, we have more homelessness because housing supports have also been eliminated in many districts near where I live. One in ten kids is homeless in addition to the other um, issues that they have. Segregation has grown. Uh, in addition, then, we have huge disparities in school funding. Our top spending states spend three times as much as our bottom spending states. Uh, the New England area is where most of the intense investments in education go on. And by the way, almost all of our high achieving states are in New England uh, as well. Uh, Massachusetts, well known for being number one, but Vermont and Maine, uh, Connecticut right on their heels. New Jersey, a recent arrival, which I'll mention in a moment. Uh, but within states as well, there's a huge disparity in funding in most states. So in California, for example, we're a low spending state, uh, but uh, our top spending districts spend four times as much as our bottom spending districts. Uh, and those are typically correlated with race and class. So uh, children who have less get, uh, when they come to school, get less when they get to school. We still have inequitable access to preschool, and there's a huge achievement gap when kids enter preschool. Some studies suggest that low-income three-year-olds have about half the vocabulary uh, in preschool as higher income three-year-olds and it's actually a widening gap for those who don't get preschool by the time they get to kindergarten and uh, still we have many, many uh, low-income kids who can't get access to preschool. Uh, and then you take those inequalities and they translate into inequalities in access to qualified and um, effective teachers and school leaders. Um, salaries are unequal across districts. Uh, so our working conditions, uh, if you want to teach in Oakland, for example, you'll earn $10,000 less than if you taught in an affluent district five miles away. Uh, and you'll have the privilege of buying most of your own supplies from your salary, um, having larger class sizes, uh, significantly larger, 40 versus 20. Uh, and that replicates across the country. So we compound the inequalities. That then also leads to disparities in access to high quality curriculum as well as materials, science labs, computers, uh, equipment, uh, and uh, dysfunctional under-resourced schools at the end of that. It all adds up. Uh, there have been lawsuits across the country uh, about this. Um, my friend John Jackson, um, I hope I don't steal a line you were planning to use, but it's one of my favorites, noted in a recent talk that every state, just about every state now has a state bird, a state flag, and a state school finance lawsuit uh, because 44 states have had such lawsuits. Uh, and just to give you a sense of what exists, in the Williams v. California case in California, uh, this was uh, just a description of one of the many schools in the complaint, and this school was called Luther Burbank School. Uh, at Luther Burbank, students cannot take textbooks home for homework in any course subject because their teachers have enough textbooks for use in class only. For homework, students must take home photographed, photocopied pages with no accompanying text for guidance or reference. When and if their teachers have enough paper to use to make homework copies, Luther Burbank is infested with vermin and roaches. Students routinely see mice in their classrooms. One dead rodent has remained decomposing in a quarter in the gymnasium since the beginning of the school year. School library is rarely open, has no librarian, has not recently been updated. The latest version of the encyclopedia was published in approximately 1988. Luther Burbank classrooms do not have computers. See, that wouldn't matter if you could just get on Wikipedia um, or something even more with greater um, accuracy. <laughs> um, computer instruction and research skills are not therefore part of Luther Burbank students' regular instruction. School no longer offers any art classes. Two of the three bathrooms are locked all day every day. Uh, students have been unable to get into an unlocked bathroom. When the bathrooms are not locked, they often lack toilet paper, um, soap, and paper towels. Ceiling tiles are missing and cracked in the school gym. School children are afraid to play games in the gym because they worry that more ceiling tiles will fall on them during their games. The school has no air conditioning. On hot days, classroom temperatures climb in the 90s. The school heating system does not work. In winter, students often wear coats, hats, and gloves during class. 11 of the 35 teachers have not yet obtained regular teaching credentials, and 17 of the 35 teachers only began teaching at Luther Burbank this school year. And in many of these schools, there's a revolving door of uh, underprepared, inexperienced teachers in and out. Obviously, um, you know, we can't compete with other countries if we don't begin to address this issue. Uh, and that's the bottom line. Uh, we should do this for moral reasons. We should uh, repair these problems for ethical reasons, but we need to do that for uh, economic reasons as well. 
<clears throat> we are number one in one area in this country, which is incarceration. New York Times called us prison nation. We have 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's inmates. That's related to education. Most inmates are functionally illiterate. Um, most are high school dropouts. Um, so we have a vicious cycle because people are then not paying taxes and getting good jobs, but they're absorbing uh, what taxpayers uh, earn. So the, this book outlines the social costs of the opportunity gap. In fact, if we can get a high school dropout to become a graduate, that adds three quarters of a million dollars to the national budget. Um, a high school dropout who becomes a four-year college graduate adds $1.7 million, closing even a third of the opportunity gap would save us $250 billion in fiscal and social costs per year. What should be done? We have, and I think you probably have in uh, materials, uh, a set of policy recommendations which replicate what other countries that are high achieving do. Uh, number one, treat children well in terms of their health care and early childhood education. Make sure they have that opportunity. Number two, provide equitable and adequate school funding as some states uh, have done and have raised achievement. In fact, one of the first things Massachusetts did uh, that pr pr promulgated their uh, ascendance to the number one state in the nation in terms of achievement was put in place a way to student funding formula uh, that gave more money to students in high poverty districts way back in the early 90s along with their standards assessments and investments in teachers. Uh, J Governor Jerry Brown just yesterday um, sort of threw down in California his insistence that he will get a way to student funding formula passed this year. So there is uh, some momentum around this around the country. Third, uh, make a broad and rich curriculum available, uh, which means meaningful learning around 21st century skills for problem solving for all kids. We can't afford to have some kids just getting rote skills, um, no science, no social studies, no art and music, uh, no higher order thinking skills, just drilling for multiple choice tests, while others get a rich curriculum. All kids need that kind of 21st century curriculum. Fourth, Prepare and support teachers as professionals. You cannot build an education system without a strong cadre of teachers and school leaders. Some states have made those investments. Uh, their achievement has followed suit. Many states have not. The federal role is almost non-existent in this area right now. Fifth, build on uh, the cultural and linguistic uh, backgrounds and diversity of our student and treat it as the asset that it is and should be. We should be a multilingual country um, as well as a multicultural country like uh, others. Uh, Singapore and Finland, for example, are both trilingual countries. Mm -hmm. Kids start in elementary school learning multiple languages uh, and that uh, makes them much more valuable in the international marketplace uh, and they realize that. And then we need to deal with communities and neighborhoods. Uh, sixth, we need to invest in stable um, communities uh, that are uh, integrated. We've backed off from that. And finally, we need to be sure that we enrich uh, learning time within and outside of school. Uh, all of these things that are, are things that are being done somewhere. Uh, in some places, a lot of them are being done well. And in some places, these are not on the table at all. Uh, but where they are on the table, we see tremendous uh, improvements. And I mentioned I would come back to New Jersey. It is more than the stretch of I-95 between Philadelphia and New York. Um, and in 1998, they uh, undertook a major school finance reform, uh, increased the low spending in high-need school districts that had left them spending half of what affluent districts spent. Um, they became one of, and put in place preschool education, uh, professional learning for adults. Um, they became one of the top rated states in the nation. They're now number one in the nation in writing. Uh, they're in the top five in every measure on NAEP. They cut the achievement gap in half. 46% students of color, more than a third of kids in poverty. Uh, and yet they are competing with states that are much more affluent uh, because they put in place the policies that make a difference. Uh, I'll just close with the words of John Dewey. What the best and wisest parent wants for his or her child, that must we want for all of our children. Any other goal is narrow and unlovely, and acted upon it destroys our democracy. This is really about reclaiming our democracy. Thank you. Good morning. My name is John Jackson, president of the Schott Foundation for Public Education. 
First of all, I want to thank you all for foregoing your opportunity to attend the opening of the Bush Library to be with us this morning. Um, and I want to also applaud Kevin, Linda, and those who were involved in uh, the publishing of the, the book for your efforts in highlighting this important issue, and definitely uh, Congressman Honda and Linda for your efforts on the commission and the report for each and every uh, child. It's true that 30 years ago after the publication of A Nation at Risk, our country went down a path toward standard-based uh, education reform. And there were a lot of good people passing good policies in a lot of different states uh, following that report. Now, some of those policies were good for something and others were good for nothing, but they were all good. Um, <laughs> And to show you that I don't um, write these jokes, I just tell them, um, 30 years later, we know now that there is a correlation between educational attainment and a community's economic base, a correlation between educational attainment and access to health care, a correlation between educational attainment and civic participation, voting, volunteerism, pillars of our democracy. And we also know that this is the first generation whose wealth projections are predicted to be lower than their parents. This is also the first generation in over 200 years whose life expectancy in the U.S. is predicted to be lower than their parents. We're also going through, uh, we're also one of the only industrialized countries whose la the skill of its labor force that's retiring is higher than the skill of those entering the labor force. And if that doesn't bring it home to you, uh, for every one person, to support every one person on Social Security, we need three workers. We're now below that, that, not, that three target. So this is a tremendous challenge that didn't just happen overnight, but it was a part of a number of policies and practices that developed following um, these past decades of standard-based reform. Um, but so what we're calling for, both in this book, both as we talk about the opportunity to learn, is a pivot. And we say that it is definitely now time for our country to pivot. A pivot from focusing primarily on outputs to focusing on inputs. A pivot from focusing on the achievement gap to a greater level of focus on the opportunity gap. A pivot from standards-based reform to support based reform, the type of reform that asks the question, what are the supports necessary so that all students can achieve the high standards and all children can re re achieve a fair and substantive opportunity to learn? And we don't need more tests to do that. Standards are important. They're very important. Uh, we need tests for diagnostic purposes. but. And this movement toward common core standards can be very beneficial if we also ensure that we have common core supports, the supports necessary for all students in each of the states to achieve these high standards. We know there is an achievement gap. We don't need an, another publication to tell us that. Uh, we know if this room was cold, we would know that the room would cold. It was cold. We don't need anyone else to bring in another thermometer. And that's where we are right now. We need to identify what are the supports necessary for all children to receive an opportunity to learn, how do we align those supports, and what are the investments that are going to be necessary to contact, to reach each child with those supports so that each child has a fair and substantive opportunity to learn. And at the Schott Foundation, we have been working for a number of years through the Opportunity to Learn campaign with grassroots advocates across the state. In fact, I leave here uh, tomorrow, I'll be in Mississippi where they are holding their Opportunity to Learn Summit. Much in the same way, advocates in New York, Arkansas, Wisconsin, um, advocates, I see Jeff Bryant online, who are even organizing around this Opportunity Agenda because it is clear, now is the time for our country to make the pivot. And what does this pivot look like? This isn't the first time that we've recognized that there is a correlation between poverty and the need to systemically change opportunities in education for our children. In fact, if you think back when ESEA was enacted in law, it was a part of Lyndon B. Johnson's war on poverty. 
We don't talk about it a lot, but it's actually a war on poverty bill. Um, but now that it still sits in Congress, the reauthorization, there's something that states have to do in order to ensure that they put in place the types of policies and practice to create an opportunity to learn pipeline. First of all, we know that there is a way to close the achievement gap without closing the opportunity gap. And in far too many cities and states, this has been the road that they've been moving on. If you push out those students whose scores you don't want to show up on your achievement score, you, have, you can close that gap, but you haven't closed the opportunity gap. No longer can we afford to, have to lose any of our students. And that's why I am encouraged by the report of the commission, each and every child. So what does a support-based reform agenda look like? What does an opportunity to learn agenda look like? It looks like, number one, ensuring that we don't use disciplinary practices to push out students, that we keep them in educational settings, that their educational services continue. And a number of organizations and uh, cities across the country are moving to change their disciplinary uh, policies and practices. Um, a number of grassroots leaders across the country have called for a moratorium on out-of-school suspension, recognizing that out-of-school suspension should be a last resort. And if it's necessary to send a child out of school, um, let's ensure that educational services continue or perhaps suspend them to a mentoring program, a faith-based institution, somewhere that they will actually receive the supports necessary in order to continue to have the opportunity to learn. Also, the research is clear. We know that if we can give a child access to high quality early education, ensure, mandatory kindergarten, and ensure that they're on grade level reading by third grade, um, we've won half of the battle. And that's why we're encouraged by the president's efforts to ensure and increase access to early education. But that's something that each of the states can take on and should take on as a part of closing the opportunity gaps. Let's ensure that we've created the supports to recruit and retain uh, highly qualified teachers. It's not enough just to offer a few incentives and have the level of turnover that we see, but let's ensure that we set up a structure where there's the appropriate supports to recruit, retain, and there's a process where there's continuous development, peer-to-peer uh, -peer development, in the teaching uh, process. And a lot of what we have been talking about, if we are going to get to each student, each and every child, there has to be more of a student-centered, deeper learning focus. Um, right now, if I were to ask you, what, what is the plan for a child that is a grade level or more behind, we may talk about opening a few charters that might be high performing. We may talk about a choice program that might uh, be able to reach a few students, but we need something for each and every child. And that's why, as a part of the Opportunity to Learn campaign, we have been talking about the need to provide students who are a grade level or more behind personal opportunity plans, a plan that would give them access to additional, three additional resources, academic, whether it be additional tutoring, ELL supports, social. We know that mentoring actually helps some students, that it helps to have a mentor to navigate through a process. There's clear research on it. The philanthropic community has supported it for a number of years. And I'm not talking about, for, about it from a perspective of providing a volunteer mentor, but a mentor that's paid for out of the uh, state and city budget coffers. Um, and I think that that's important. And I know there are a lot of people who might say, well, we don't have the money. We're coming out of a recession. But we pay for probationary officers out of these um, budgets. So this is definitely a pivot. And it seems to me that if we know that mentoring and early education are actually effective and high returns on investment, we would invest on the front end and project a lower need for the cost of incarceration on the back end and recognize a cost saving in our budget. So the question and the choice that we have to make, are we going to budget for opportunity or budget for oppression? So we should provide each and every student, academic, social, and finally, the health checks. We can identify what are the health challenges that serve as barriers to a student's opportunity to learn. Eyesight, 
mental health, asthma. Let's ensure that every student who's a grade level or more has a personal plan that can give them um, access to these additional supports and put it in policy so that there's, there's a policy driver that forces that alignment. This is going to be a shift. It's going to be a shift that is going to require us to make uh, choices, choices in how we budget. And at the state level, we may say, well, where do we, you know, get the money to do this? I think one of the things that we're trying to achieve is a better alignment of existing resources. How do we align the existing resources in order to provide the, the network to provide the support? On the other side is how do we identify what are the additional investments that we need to make and where those investments should be made? So to be direct, we, we have a choice at this point. If a state continues to spend more, and we've all heard about it, more on the cost of incarceration than we spend on the cost to educate, um, that state is going to have a problem, serious problem in the future. For political leaders, political leaders who choose to continue to tell the narrative of why these investments around primarily around standards-based reform, primarily around incarcerations are important, they will find that their politics will be increasingly become irrelevant because that type of leadership only leads to a state economy that is irrelevant in a global market, a labor force that is irrelevant in a global market. So this is a calling for us to address the opportunity gap, but more importantly, it's a calling for us to give every child a fair and substantive opportunity to learn, every state the opportunity to grow its economy, and to give our country the opportunity to strengthen our democracy and the opportunity to succeed. Thank you. It really started getting going, and the rest of the country started to join into that. So we went from the Civil Rights Movement, and from that, I think the phrase, um, all children have a right to an equal opportunity in education came about. A lot of movements started uh, since then to make sure that we achieve uh, equal um, rights and e equality for all the children. Since then, we've tried desegregation. It hasn't worked. We've been looking at how neighborhoods are formed because we see that Poor performing children come from poor schools that are found in poor neighborhoods. So the question's got to be raised, you know, how do poor neighborhoods come about? I mean, planners do not, you know, consciously develop poor neighborhoods. The, um, this great book, Closing the Opportunity Gap, it, it talks about a lot of different issues very, very candidly. And <laughs> I read some of it last night. The terminology for me is, you know, way up here. And the way I speak English is way down here, so it's more um, understandable. But what I had to do is translate a lot of the concepts that they were talking about. It dovetails with the kinds of things that the um, commission had put together. So one of the things that we're looking at is um, the, um, the report when we talk about each and every child, the binding principle for everything that I'm looking at f from here on out as a 30-year um, teacher is that looking at the, listening to the expression, instead of saying all children deserve an equal opportunity to education, to rephrase that, to have a better solution set and saying. Well, good morning. Um, thank you for all coming. Um, um, my apologies for our late start here. Um, my name's uh, Jamie Horwitz. I'm a member of the Newsmaker Committee of the National Press Club. And we're delighted to, on this 30th anniversary of the Nation at Risk Report, to be talking about a new direction for education reform. And um, our speakers today will be Congressman um, Michael Honda, Kevin Wellner, who's at the university, a professor at the University of Colorado and also the director of the National Education Policy Center. Uh, Professor Linda Darling-Hammond of Stanford University, and um, Mr. John Jackson, who's president of the Schott Foundation. And each of our speakers will speak for about seven to ten minutes.
and then after that we'll we'll throw it open for questions for about 25 or 30 minutes. I um, I and, and if you don't mind holding the questions till the Q and A period. So with that, um, why don't we ask uh, Congressman um, Honda to start us off? Good morning, and um, I'm the reason we started late, so. <laughs> my, my father always said, state the obvious. And so, <laughs> thank, thank you for waiting being a patient. And also, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, being here and w with this panel also. The, uh, I'll, let me get right to it. Um, the, uh, the report uh, for each and every child is probably the very first report that was put together by educators. Uh, we had Nation at Risk before, uh, which uh, one of the comments that came out of there was, um, if a nation to ever tried to impose, I was looking at when we tried to put together a, a bill, then it went through the appropriations process and um, Secretary of Education, uh, um, Arne Duncan had moved it into a uh, commission I wanted to find out whether what we're doing could be done a little bit better. We know that public education has no common roots in this country. At least if you think about it, we don't. It was not mentioned in the Constitution, so therefore it was set aside to be the purview of the states. And so uh, up to now we have 50 states struggling every year to um, provide an equitable education to everyone uh, of their students. But when you look at the history of this country, since there was no educational system um, existing back in 1789, um, states were left to their own devices. And when you think about the, the um, genesis of uh, this country and the origin of a lot of the different kinds of efforts in education, it's all different. And it wasn't until 1950s that we started to realize that some of the principles of some states were not in conformance with the rest of this country. And I'm saying that some states had developed a concept and a principle of separate but equal. And these were brought together by the different states, reflecting their history and reflecting their background and reflecting also the principle state by state. When TV came along, it brought those kinds of issues to our living room and the civil rights movement started. And when we started to realize that separate but equal is existing in other states, it just didn't seem right. And then the civil rights movement, a mediocre um, educational system in our country that would be tantamount to declaring war. And, um, but as we move through our public education experience, we seem to be going more and more towards that um, mediocrity, and um, I think that there's a lot of effort in this country to try to improve our system. But I, I think that uh, in its effort, we have not stepped outside of the box to see what it is that we really need to do. This report brings together quite a few things, and uh, when you have 27 um, folks who have been engaged in education for the number of years that they've been engaged in, and for them to speak to each other and try to arrive at a, a document uh, with some consensus, it's, um, it's a real task because they all are experts in their own specific areas and they're bringing them together has been a, a wonderful experience. Uh, it took 22 months uh, to do this under the leadership of um, um, Chris uh, Edley, uh, who is the um, the Dean of Law over at UC Berkeley and um, Tino Cuellar, who uh, teaches uh, constitutional law at Stanford. And prior to that, we had um, a Reed uh, Hastings as one of the co-chairs. Uh, Linda Darling Hammond was uh, uh, one of our major uh, contributors, uh, but they all participated in working towards this uh, report. And at times, uh, it was uh, push and pull but it was all with this one thing in mind, in, in understanding and trying to figure out how we provide 
equity in education and excellence in education for each and every child. One of the things that um, achievement equity for each and every child becomes a binding uh, principle. How do we achieve equity for each and every child? And the, and the movement for resources in, in this country, we start looking at raising the average daily attendance. And there's a, there's a race in trying to see uh, how much money we need to have behind each and every child. Every state has a different level. But let's say in California we achieved um, a ADA of $10,000 behind each and every child. Um, if we say that each child is different, then the effort and the resources behind the, each child would be different. But the way we set up our, our finance system is ADA, same amount of money behind each child. So that means that you know, every child has the same issues and will be um, taken care of by the same amount of money. That's the equal, but it's not equity. So if we look at each and every child, each child has different needs, then the cost of every child is going to be different. The resources to be applied to each child is going to be different. And so we'll see different amounts of resources needed to bear upon each child in order for that child to be able to achieve the equity that we're looking for. So ADA is equal amounts or parity. Equity is that each and every child is afforded that which that child needs based upon assessments. When you go off on that tangent or that direction, the cost of education is going to be very expensive. But what is the uh, cost right now that we're faced with as a nation in a, trying to find that silver lining for all our children?